what preceded all along the border, the invasion, was a massive rocket attack designed specifically to get people into their shelters. Hamas knew this. They knew an awful lot. If you happen to be very creative and jerry-rig the door, the door handle, in such a way that it couldn't be depressed, they could not get in. When they could not get in, where possible, they would fire through the door. If firing in with their Kalachnikovs didn't work, they fired RPGs. If that didn't work, they set explosives. And if that didn't work, they set the house on fire. Those who were in the bomb shelters faced one of two alternatives, to remain in the shelters and die of uh, smoke inhalation, which many did, or to exit the, the shelters and then either be executed on the spot or be taken hostage. Shalom and welcome to the State of a Nation. I'm Elon Levy. The residents of Kibbutz Niroz have not had time to mourn. It's been eight months since the October 7th massacre and still the wound is open and bleeding. This tight-knit community was the hardest hit, with over a quarter of its people massacred or abducted on October 7th. Brutally slaughtered or taken hostage by monsters who'd fled back to Gaza by the time the Israeli army even got there. They had lived through years of Hamas attacks on their community with the non-stop rockets and mortars and even sniper fire, but nothing could prepare them for this bloodbath. And so many of those Israelis taken hostage are still trapped there. Professor Jonathan Dekel Chen was a resident of Kibbutz near Oz, a mile away from Gaza with his family. By the grace of God, he wasn't home that gruesome weekend and survived. But his son, Sagid Dekelchen, 35, a US Israeli citizen, was taken hostage as he fought to hold back the terrorist invasion. Survivors of Hamas captivity saw him in tunnels under Khan Yunus before December. Since then, nothing is known of his fate. Jonathan is fighting for his son's freedom and that of all 125 hostages as of the recording of this opening demanding our government bring them home, and he doesn't hold back in his criticism of the Israeli government in our brutally frank and open conversation, and demanding of world governments to pressure Hamas to let them go because they haven't done enough, and it will never be enough until they are all home. This episode will be painful to listen to and contains graphic description of the atrocities of October 7th. But we can't let the world forget what happened and we can't let it forget the hostages buried alive, rotting in Hamas captivity. With impeccable clarity and unrelenting force, Jonathan takes us through the diplomatic and strategic battle being fought across Israel on the world stage to free his son and all the hostages. With the goal of bringing back the hostages, bringing down the Hamas regime, which he calls evil, and making sure that never again means just that. My conversation with Jonathan Dekelchen, father of hostage Sagi, pulls no punches and takes a stark and truly uncomfortable look at where we stand today as a people eight months into the October 7th hostage crisis. And you should feel uncomfortable because none of us are free till all of them are free. Welcome to State of a Nation. Breaking news out of Israel this morning. Shocking hostage taking. Hundreds of Israelis are dead. I want to bring in Israeli government spokesman. Elon. What happens when a four-day course? How do you resolve this? Where does this go? You can't do this. Why is this Professor Dekel Khan, welcome to State of a Nation. Thank you for having me. On 10-7, your son, Sagi, was abducted into the Gaza Strip. Now, you also survived 10-7. By grace of God, you weren't at home kibbutz near Oz the same day. Before we get onto the story of what happened, I'm wondering, where have you been for the last nearly eight months, displaced from a kibbutz that is yet to be rebuilt? Yes, well, there, there are many tragedies and many sagas that are connected to October 7th. Uh, one of them is the destruction of a community and a way of life on kibbutz near Oz and a number of other kibbutzim that are situated along the border with Gaza. The specific situation of Nir Oz is um, 
the day after the massacre, the surviving community was evacuated to Elat, to a hotel in Elat, where we all congregated and lived for about three months, in all the while trying to figure out next steps. There is no option uh, now or any time in the foreseeable future for us to return to the kibbutz. Nir Oz, unlike the other kibbutzim, was completely destroyed on October 7th for reasons that we can discuss later on. Um, and of course, the security situation is ongoing. So there's nowhere to go back to. We knew that on October 8th. Um, through work of our own, mostly, um, we were able to acquire a group of, of apartments in uh, Karme Gat, which is adjacent to Kiryat Gat, between Be'er Sheva and Jerusalem, where uh, about 120 families, households, uh, we all moved there in the beginning of, of January and sort of kind of have settled in, uh, but the trauma is so complex and so all-encompassing that we're in a kind of perpetual limbo uh, that's comprised of confusion, fear, grief, um, truly not knowing what comes next. Um, we expect to be there um, at least for a couple of years, and uh, truly we, we, we don't know, none of us know what comes next. So in effect, uh, Nir Oz and, and other kibbutz communities, and, and many others right now in, in Israel from the south and from the north, we are refugees in our own country. As our listeners can hear from your accent, you are American. Your son, Sagi, is one of the eight American citizens still in Hamas captivity. Three of those, tragically, have been confirmed dead. Tell me the story of what you know about what happened to Sagi on October 7th and how he was abducted into the Gaza Strip. Mm. Well, the story of Sagi is, is really, it, it can't and shouldn't be separated from the entirety of the day or more specifically, what happened on Nir Oz on October 7th. Uh, Sagi, who at the time was a father of two little girls and uh, married to a wonderful wife, Avital, who was at that moment seven months pregnant, uh, did what was his habit on Saturday mornings and holiday mornings. Um, he went off to do some work on his pet project. Uh, and his pet project for many, many years on the kibbutz has been refurbishing old buses into usable objects. Um, he grew up, Sagi, next to me. I wasn't born a professor. I worked for many years in agricultural machinery, high-tech agricultural machinery, and he sort of grew up by my side on the kibbutz. Very handy guy, very creative guy. And on the morning of October 7th, he had... Um, He'd opened sort of a new chapter in this refurbishment, and he was working with an Israeli nonprofit to convert four old airport buses um, into mobile technology, high-tech classrooms for underserved communities in the south of the country. Amazing. He's an amazing guy, and it's, um, it's, it's really quite something to see. Two of those buses actually have already gone into service um, with that nonprofit. In any case, he got up early, as was his habit. Uh, if I had been there on the kibbutz that morning, I probably would have gotten up to go with him. It's sort of our bonding thing is working together on his buses. Um, his the, the workshop, so to speak, was in the, so the, 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 the machine shop area of the kibbutz, which is adjacent to the residential area. Uh, at around quarter to seven in the morning, he was one of the first people who was awake, of course, on the kibbutz, who spotted um, groups of terrorists that had come in. And um, he spotted a group, uh, immediately notified the kibbutz as a whole that there were terrorists inside the kibbutz. And our first responder team um, that's on the kibbutz uh, so that they could get organized to figure out you know, what comes next. Um, he then spent the next couple of hours um, as what turned out to be 200 heavily armed, well-trained Nuhba terrorists rampaged through the kibbutz, along with several hundred looters, um, mostly unarmed, but violent in their own right, from 
little children all the way up to grannies. These were civilians from the Gaza Strip they who were, came in with the, what was it, the second, the third wave into Israel? Uh, very close on the heels of the Nukba terrorists, evidently, uh, streamed across in, in the hundreds, if not thousands, into near Oz to uh, essentially steal anything that they could get their hands on um, and then burn whatever uh, they couldn't move or, or didn't want to move. So that included, in the end, everything from my grandchildren's tricycle that I had near my home to our largest farm machinery. Um, and this is well-documented aerial footage uh, of our property being streamed into Gaza. In any case, for the next couple of hours until around 8.30, uh, Sagi worked alongside the first responder team, um, trying, first of all, to understand what was going on, because we had no warning whatsoever. And for those who aren't familiar, every kibbutz down south has, when you say first responders, these are civilian defense teams who are lightly armed, albeit, but they're supposed to be the first line of defense against any potential terrorist infiltration. Yeah, it's also, that's absolutely true. But it's also important to note that this first responder team are also our firemen in case there's a fire on the kibbutz. Uh, these same guys distributed food during the COVID lockdown mm. with golf carts just running around the kibbutz and distributing lunch to everyone or anyone who wanted it. Um, so these are, are just good-willed, mostly young men, but not so young uh, men as well. Um, and and our, their job, and I was sort of the, the old fogey in, in that group, um, the job in, in a military situation um, is to simply um, um, contain, observe, and connect to the army when it arrives. And here's the key element of that day, certainly on the kibbutzim. We've always been trained and expected and been told by the army that from the moment, the Israeli army, that from the moment there's a border infiltration, we're about a mile from the border, when there's a border infiltration, the army will arrive in force within 15 minutes tops. 15 minutes. 15, one five minutes um, and in the meantime, that first responder team is there to figure out what's going on, to observe, and to engage only when there's danger, lives are endangered, because we're simply not equipped, and we don't have the numbers to do much more than that. Well, as been well documented, um, unlike any other kibbutz or any other place, uh, the army never came. Uh, the IDF never fired a shot, or the police never fired a shot in near Oz. They only arrived at about 2.30 in the afternoon, which is approximately an hour after the terrorists and almost all of the looters had departed. They had done whatever they wanted to do and left. And for those who aren't familiar with the horrific damage wrought on kibbutz near Oz, summarize it for us. The magnitude of what the Nuhba terrorists and the army of civilian looters left behind them in near Oz. Well, most importantly is the loss of life, of course. Uh, we now know it's taken time to assess it all. We now know that 50 of our people were murdered outright on October 7th. Um, some of the bodies of the murdered were taken into Gaza. For what reasons, I, I, it's difficult to explain. Um, a total of 78 people were taken hostage from kibbutz near Oz, and my son amongst them. Both the murdered and the hostages raged in age from nine-month-olds to 80-year-olds. There was no differentiation. They, there was also a massacre on near Oz of our Thai workers. Um, we had a small group of Thai workers who worked and lived with us, and um, the terrorists were particularly brutal in, when massacring the Thai workers. 50 people murdered. Yes. How many abducted? 78. Out of a community of, this isn't a city, this is a small community of... No, on a good day, a little over 400 total residents. A little over 400 residents. So we're talking over a quarter That's correct. of the population yes. abducted or murdered. There isn't even a word in the English language to describe that. Decimated is reduced by a tenth, reduced by a quarter. The only word I can think of is, is act of genocide. Well, as a historian, I, I'm, I try to stay away from that word. Um, it was a massacre. It was a wholesale massacre uh, 
a blood mania on their part, um, which included beheadings, uh, rape of women um, before killing them, um, brutality that I think the normal human mind simply cannot conjure. And it happened all in my home in a very small community. Uh, as far as the destruction, the physical destruction beyond the human destruction, about 40% of all of our buildings uh, were burned to the ground. Um, another 40... Many with people inside them. Yes, some of my best friends were uh, burned, um, incinerated, asphyxiated inside their homes, including friends of our family for three generations, the uh, Kedem Simanto family. Uh, with the, the three little children. Three little children and uh, the grandmother who's been my friend for more than 40 years, Carol Simanto, a different home on the kibbutz who was uh, executed in her bed uh, along with many others. Uh, so about 40% of our homes and buildings, including our dining room and little market, were burned to the ground. 40% more were rendered uninhabitable because of the damage done by the burning of the 40%, and whatever was left standing, it was totally looted. Uh, in total, the terrorists um, and, the, and the looters, there were only two homes on the kibbutz for reasons that you know we'll probably never know, that they did not enter into. Uh, but everything else was destroyed and emptied uh, of, all, of all worldly objects, really. And Sagir is abducted to the Gaza Strip. Yes, at around 8.30 that morning, um, it was clear that our first responders um, were down. They, there were only two people left in that sort of communication system who were still responding. Um, Sagi then went to his own home. By that time, and, and, and I'm conjecturing a little bit, but I, I believe it to be true, by that time, it was clear to Sagi what exactly was going on and how the Nukba terrorists and the looters were operating. And he had realized the, one of the fundamental flaws of our self-defense system, which was in our safe rooms. Our safe rooms are, are attached bomb shelters, were constructed in 2008 um, after the first major round of Hamas rocketing and mortar fire into the kibbutz along all of the border kibbutzim. And uh, together with the army, we constructed uh, attached bomb shelters to all of our homes for the very simple reason that once we heard by our alarm system that there was incoming fire, we were so close to the Gaza Strip, at best we had 15 seconds to get into a hardened space. So. And these bomb shelters are designed to help you with mortar fire, Correct. not terrorists trying to burn you exactly. alive in your beds. In, in, in fact, um, the tragedy was that um, they were designed not to be locked from the inside. Uh, the whole idea being that if, God forbid, there was a direct hit from a mortar or from a rocket or even from an anti-tank uh, missile, uh, there were a direct hit and there was damage to the bomb shelter, we could render aid by coming in from the outside. These aren't panic rooms. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Um, and of course, with the massacre on October 7th, the bomb shelters thereby became death traps because what preceded all along the border, the invasion, was a massive rocket attack designed specifically to get people into their shelters. Hamas knew this. They knew an awful lot about how the army and how the kibbutzim would respond. Everyone's in their bomb shelter, as it were, kind of easy targets for the terrorists. They knew that they couldn't be opened from outside. Um, those people and, and, and the first responder teams were communicating this to our people, although it was difficult to communicate because inside the bomb shelters, there's no telephone reception. Hmm. So not all information was transmitted. What they tried to transmit was that to try in any way possible to hold the door closed. If you happen to be a very strong man, or um, if you happen to be very creative and jerry-rig the door, 
the door handle in such a way that it couldn't be depressed, they could not get in. When they could not get in, where possible, they would fire through the door. In some cases, we learned the doors were bulletproof. In other cases, they weren't. If firing in with their Kalachnikovs didn't work, they fired RPGs into the safe rooms through the doors. If that didn't work, they set explosives. And if that didn't work, they set the house on fire. In, in b- believing, and it was correct, that those who were in the bomb shelters faced one of two alternatives, to remain in the shelters and die of uh, smoke inhalation, which many did, or to exit the, the shelters and then either be executed on the spot or be taken hostage. At around 8.30 that morning, Sagi ran home, uh, made sure that his wife and two little girls were okay in their safe room, jerry-rigged the bomb shelter door so it could not be opened from the outside, uh, kissed his wife and said that he had to stay outside, uh, which he did. And for the next 45 minutes or so, we know that he uh, exchanged fire, as many, many young and not so young men did on the kibbutz with the terrorists at around uh, 9.30. Uh, that was the last time uh, anyone communicated with him from the kibbutz. But we know from witness testimony afterwards, after release of hostages in, in late November, early December, that he was taken to Gaza with another 77 people from our kibbutz. He was taken alive and wounded. Um, and we got confirmation in late November, early December, that he still is alive by the 40 um, hostages from near Oz who were released, women and children. So a handful of the women who came out at that time and a couple of teenagers were able to tell us and and many others um, that they had seen our loved ones, in our case, very, very briefly in the tunnels under Khan Yunus. What did they tell you about his condition physically, mentally? I won't go into too many details, but um, he was alive. He clearly had been wounded um, in the exchange of fire in and around his house. We know that several grenades were thrown in his house. Uh, It's very easily seen in a fairly intense gun battle was fought in and around his home. And his wife, Avital, then heavily pregnant, seven months, two children. How does she survive? the massacre of Nir Oz. There were little miracles during that day. Immense tragedy that we may never recover from, but there were also small miracles. Um, Avital has the strength of a lion. I, I really don't know where it comes from in this tiny, rail-thin frame of hers. Um, she was able, despite the shock of, all, in, of it all, and the enormous fear, keep in mind, that anyone who is on the kibbutz is perfectly aware of what's going on. There are explosions all day long in people's home, in people's homes. There's f- gunfire everywhere. People are trying to access through the bomb shelter door and an armored window in the back, which also couldn't be locked from the inside. Sagi so Jerry rigged that as well. Um, and somehow or another, she was able to keep her head, her six-year-old girl bar uh, grew up that morning and um, took responsibility for her little sister, Gali, who's about two and a half years old, a little over two years old at that time. They had no food. They had almost no water. And uh, they were only released from the bomb shelter around 4.30 in the afternoon, uh, which is many, many hours of being in, 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 in such a hell hellhole. Um, it's just a strength of character. Um, there are, we now understand why in certain places, the terrorists were not able to access certain bomb shelters. In her neighborhood where they lived, it was a neighborhood where they lived. Um, it was our newest neighborhood on the kibbutz, built just a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, this minor detail that no one would have thought of it was made of fire retardant materials, of course, because it's a relatively new neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Therefore, in most of the apartments around there, uh, in their neighborhood, uh, the terrorists were not able to actually ignite fires. 
And because of the construction, without getting too deep in, in, in the reeds, because of the construction of the house, um, they could not fire through the armor door. Um, and so if they couldn't pull it open and they couldn't set fire to the house, um, then at some point, and perhaps because of the commotion that Sagi created, um, they must have moved on to other homes to continue their murder and rampaging. Now, while all this rampage is going on, the brutal massacre of Niaz, the inhabitants believe they've always been told the army will be there in 15 minutes, and it didn't happen. And they were completely abandoned and left to fend for themselves. How do you understand how this happened? Why did the Israeli state fail on October 7th such that its citizens were left totally abandoned to the whims of the Hamas death squads? Well, I dearly hope that there will be uh, a major investigation, impartial investigation in Israel. Um, there were calls this morning from um, uh, Benny Gantz to do such a thing. Um, I don't know if that will begin before or after this war is over. I know it must be done. Uh, all I can do is conjecture uh, based on um, my reading of the situation. I think there, there are two, sort of two areas in which we can answer that question. Short term is the easier part. Um, Hamas studied the Israeli army along the border. It had detailed plans, uh, well-practiced. It had maps of our kibbutz. Internal maps were found on bodies of dead terrorists in, uh, in, in near Oz marking specific places of importance and also specific people of importance. Um, Sorry, they, they not only came to hunt down and execute civilians, they had essentially kill lists of individuals they wanted to correct. hunt? That's correct. Uh, who, people who they considered, for their reasons, um, particularly important to hunt. Such as? Uh, I, I'll leave that and uh, I'll... I'll refrain from answering that question, but um, people that they believed were of importance to do as much possible damage to the kibbutz uh, and certainly the ability of the kibbutz to defend itself. I'm astonished. This is actually the first time that I'm hearing that Hamas entered with specific assassination lists. There's an awful lot that has not yet been told about that day. Um, it, it, of course, that's just one detail. Um, for all intents and purposes, and I this is, this is public information. Uh, Hamas uh, essentially debilitated the entire observation system along the border. The cameras, the sensors. Um, its first strike was at the divisional headquarters, not too far from near Oz, to totally incapacitate the command and control capacity of the army in our area. Um, a brigade commander of our area was killed at 7 a.m. It was utter chaos. And um, uh, yes, please. One of the reasons this happened, Hamas studied the army very well, but, and this is uncontroversial, Israel had fallen into what we call the conception. The belief Hamas is deterred, it's interested in governing Gaza, we've been allowing workers to come into uh, Israel, including your kibbutz yes. from Gaza. Yes. Things are getting better. They're not going to jeopardize that. They couldn't possibly be so crazy as to launch an attack on Israel when they know how we would respond. They know what the cost would be. That was the conception of the defense establishment. They, they saw them training right up to the border and said, well, they're not really planning an attack. This is just bravado because they know how destructive it would be. And I'm wondering whether the residents of your kibbutz on October 6th shared that conception. Hamas is deterred. The army is strong. Hamas couldn't possibly be so crazy as to launch an attack. Did you, did you believe that? What we certainly believed, and we believed that no matter what happened, no matter what happened, the IDF would be there for us. Our kibbutz had been established in 1955, which is around the time that most of the kibbutzim along the Gaza border were created. And at that time, there was a, an unspoken contract. These kibbutzim would build the breadbasket 
and the vegetable basket uh, for the country of Israel and be an exporting powerhouse. We would be the human barrier on the border of Gaza. Um, we would be able to take care of ourselves. Didn't need much, got very little from the government, but in our moment of need, which would be security, the army would be there for us. So we dealt less in sort of the intelligence aspect and assessments of what's going on in Gaza. What we did know, however, is that um, from 2007, uh, our kibbutz had been the target, as we said, of event, uh, at the beginning, rudimentary, sort of homemade rockets and, and mortar fire. But that developed over time into military grade munitions, rockets, mortars, uh, anti-tank fire, sniper fire at the people who worked in our fields uh, a couple of years back, uh, incendiary kites that became a true danger, and explosive balloons. We had explosives landing in our swimming pool area with kids all around. Um, we lived with a sense of impending in, in imminent danger. Um, but I don't think it would have... Look, my son, my, my elder son reminded me not too long ago, um, after October 7th, that I had always wondered, you know, if it was, if the people of Gaza, people of Gaza, not Hamas, were so desperate, why didn't they simply, all of them, a million plus, line up on the border fence and just start walking in an act of civil disobedience into Israel? Now, that never happened. Um, wow. But... But on October 7th, what we witnessed was a kind of military version or militarized version of that. You're right. There was a conception. It was both um, a, a colossal failure of military intelligence. Um, I think we don't even know the tip of that iceberg. Um, I think that comes from a kind of inherited arrogance in Israel. A it's exactly the same conception as the Yom Kippur War. They saw the Egyptians and the Syrians training on the border, and they said, these aren't preparations for war. They can't possibly be that mad. Well, it's a chronic underestimation of an enemy, uh, which, of course, is connected to one's own hubris. Um, but I think that lets the government off the hook. We have to keep in mind that Benjamin Netanyahu has been prime minister most of the time since 1996. Um, and the army takes orders from the government. And so from our perspective, from my personal perspective, um, the main accountability for the disaster, and this is a national disaster. What happened to us is horrific. This is a national disaster. Does it mean? Um, there can be no doubt that the main accountable party here in this fatally flawed fatally fought con uh, um, conception of the importance of the border versus other security uh, zones in the country and development zones in the country took the eyes off of what was clearly an imminent danger. You know, for God's sakes, the women observers, the tatsbitaniot, as, as they're called in Hebrew, were, were yelling and screaming. But, and they got threatened that they would be court-martialed if they that's didn't, correct. If they didn't shut that, up when that they warned the, about. That comes from the top. It's not just the general staff. It is a governmental conception. What's important? What do we not want to hear? And the writing was on the wall. I want to just go back to something you said before when you said it never happened that they simply linked hands and ran towards the border. Because you lived through the 2018 Gaza border riots when Yechir Sinwar told people to storm the border, to rip the Jews' hearts out of their chests. They did try to violently storm the border in 2018. Israel responded with force. It was condemned for doing so. But this was the sort of massacre that, that could have happened if they had broken through the border fence. I'm wondering, in, in 2018, while they were trying to storm the border, what did you understand about what they wanted to do if they were able to get through? It, was this a scenario that you thought the people of Gaza, Hamas, would do if they ever had the chance? Or was this beyond the evil that you thought even they were capable of? I think that what happened on October 7th, be it Nero's or in the Nova Festival, is kind of beyond human imagination. I would hope 
it is beyond most people's imagination, the brutality, the senseless brutality of that day, the savagery. Um, we, I would say I, but, but keep in mind also that there's a huge irony sort of hiding behind all of what happened on October 7th, the communities that were attacked. And I would imagine a great majority of those young people who were attacked, the Nova Festival, a bunch of peaceniks. We mm. believed at heart that Hamas was evil. There's no question. There's no question. No, no one could possibly be confused about that. Not Hamas. in Israel, at least. Around the world, some no. people clearly are. Of course, of course. But I think any level-headed person, any person of conscience cannot believe then or now, it's certainly not now, but even in 2018, that Hamas was anything other than a, a murderous terrorist organization that takes, first and foremost, takes advantage of its own people in, in its own sort of messianic plan. So I think what we thought at the time was that, you know, thank God for the IDF, because as you said, the IDF, it was there on the border. There were ugly scenes um, useless, senseless loss of life, but the IDF stopped it. What we believed, and, and, and honestly, I'm very confused after October 7th, what we believed until October 7th was that if we remove, if it were possible, if one could remove Hamas and this murderous messianic Islamic ideology, then the people of Gaza were more or less just like us in terms of what their dreams were for their kids and their grandkids. Um, Hamas has been able to run freely in Gaza with the help of the Israeli government, by the way, in terms of this conception, since 2007, 2008. That's a long time to infect a population, and Israel has sort of done its part to um, just amplify that hatred before October 7th. How so? Uh, very tight-fisted, you know, uh, in terms of allowing Gazans to live more freely than they were allowed to be. Um, because this was part of the conception in the years, the massacre was immediately preceded by opening up Gaza to more trade, to more workers coming bit, into Israel. A little bit. We shouldn't overestimate that. Um, unfortunately, as we learned, um, it was not monitored completely which is very Israeli, to make a decision and that then not follow up truly with accountability about how it's being executed. Uh, so there were, we saw them. I didn't personally, but I learned later that people from the kibbutz saw Palestinian workers from Gaza sort of aimlessly wandering around the kibbutz. Um, During the massacre? No, 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 no. Before the massacre. Before the massacre. Before the massacre. They reported it um, and there were no answers from the army, what they were doing there. And they suspect that now these workers who came into work on the kibbutz were in fact doing reconnaissance? In all probability, but again, there has to be a thorough investigation of all of this. Absolutely. Yes. Your son, Sagi, was abducted to Gaza as a father of two. He's now a father of three, yes. because his wife, Avital, gave birth while he was in captivity. And I don't want to pry and ask, how is she doing? How are the children doing? I'll give, give them the privacy. but. As a family made the very brave decision to actually share with the media a video of her giving birth while her husband was, was not by her side. And, and, and with your permission, because this is a video that, that you've made public, we'd like to show that for viewers who are following us on uh, YouTube, where, where they can see the video material that we have here. <laughs> because I just want him to come home. To meet her. That's the whole story. Sagi is the whole story. And this whole birth is because of him. He protected us so much. And this is happening thanks to him. Here we see her being being handed their third daughter without her husband uh, by her side where he should be. And I want to know, what discussions did you have within the family about this brave decision to expose that intimate moment? Because there, there is no rule book. There is no rule book about how you fight 
for someone who has been taken hostage, how you raise global awareness, and, and that cannot have been an easy decision. Well, it was Avital's alone. Um, very early after uh, October 7th, a film crew got in contact with her from one of the Israeli, uh, main Israeli channels and um, wanted to interview her. She was not prepared to do so. We were all very much in shock. Of course. Um, but somehow or another, um, that film crew was, uh, Avital did agree for them to accompany her, gather film, gather material, and then at some point in the future, she would, Avital would decide whether or not she would want that to be released to the public. So I believe that film that we saw, or that, that um, report, uh, it was probably about two months ago it came out, more or less. And I think Avital, um, you know, we talked about it, but it was very much her decision, um, was just as desperate as the rest of us are. And wanting to do everything she knew how to do to affect change in attitudes in our country this isn't for foreign consumption. That's not why it was made. It was very much for domestic consum consumption inside of Israel. Uh, not just to raise awareness, but to humanize the story, our story, but so many others. A few weeks before Avital gave birth, um, uh, Sigal Yehud, another mother from near Oz, whose husband has been missing also, he's also a hostage, Dolev, um, same, exactly the same situation. She gave birth a few weeks before um, to humanize this story and to not let Israelis and perhaps the decision makers more than anyone else look away from the hostages as some kind of sterile collateral damage in their fantastical war plans. Um, Is that how you fear the government sees the hostages? Uh, I've been well documented. Uh, yes, I, I do believe that uh, most of the government ministers, not all, most of the government ministers, um, if they don't believe that themselves, they are captive because of Israeli domestic politics and their desire to retain power. They are captive to messianic views within uh, the Israeli government. Are you saying that because at the beginning of the war, it was very clear that the goals of freeing the hostages and destroying Hamas went hand in hand? I don't agree. You don't agree? No. Because the government said, I, I, no, I, the government, I, I, the I want to hear why you push back. No, no, I, I, I want to hear your pushback. The government's line was, the only thing that is going to get the hostages out is military pressure. The more military pressure we put on Hamas, the more likely we are to get the hostages out. And in late November, Hamas agreed to release over 100 hostages. And the government says we got them out through military pressure. Now it seems that those goals are fraying more than they were before, because if Hamas agrees to let the hostages go, it will only be for an end of the war. But you don't agree that that was the strategy or that was what happened? Well, I think it's pretty clear that the Netanyahu government was forced into that first deal um, by the U.S. government. I think it's been forced to do many things by the U.S. government. I think for the most part, for the benefit, not just of, of the hostages, but also Israel. Why do you think the government had to be forced into that, because it claimed it, of course, as, as a vindication of its strategy, that the strategy was working. Uh, that's post facto. Um, I think it's been clear from the statements, certainly after that initial exchange of hostages for Palestinian uh, detainees and prisoners, it's been clear by their own statements from government ministers that from their point of view, the, the main issue is the destruction of Hamas, period. They're very sorry about the suffering of the hostages and their families, but that can't be, uh, from their point of view, mm. that can't be the main or even a main consideration. You don't have to believe me. Look at the tape. I mean, they're saying it out loud. Um, and in terms of more evidence, this has repeatedly happened as since that initial exchange, as it would seem that Hamas in Israel, through the intermediaries, are drawing closer to something that looks like an actual agreement. Um, our government withdraws negotiators, um, muzzles them, executes some very aggressive act that is questionable in terms of how much it will accomplish militarily. What act are you referring to here? 
anything from attacks in Syria to uh, rolling into um, uh, to Rafiyah. The only way, look, no one has to convince me or anyone else from the border kibbutzim that Hamas is evil and needs to be destroyed, incapacitated as a military and governing organization. Who We're knows all... that, like you, who've come under so many years of incessant mortar fire and anti-tank missiles and all the attacks as you described just yes. now. So no one can pull the, patri uh, the, the patriotic card on me um, or, or anyone else, really, in, in these communities. Earned um, it the hard way with blood and tears. Exactly. However, um, the only way the hostages, and, and any child understands this, the only way that they are as many as possible can come home alive. And quite honestly, we don't know if any of them are alive anymore. I don't know if my son is alive. Just from near Oz alone, we have 26 hostages remaining. Um, 11 of them are confirmed dead. We have no idea about the others. Um, but what I do know for sure is that military action alone is not going to get the hostages out. It will get them killed uh, because an Israeli commando knocking on Yechez Sinwar's door somewhere underground or above ground in Gaza, the only thing that's going to happen next is the hostages get executed on the spot, whoever's still alive. Because uh, Yechez Sinwar is almost certainly surrounding himself with hostages as human shield. One would expect. He and other leaders of Hamas. Um, the only way they're coming out alive and to recover the bodies of the dead for proper burial in Israel is through some kind of negotiated process with a horrific enemy, horrific enemy, a cynical, brutalizing enemy. But in order to complete a negotiation process, you have to stay at the table. You cannot seek out and then jump on any possible excuse to pull your negotiators, to muzzle them, or to take all sorts of actions that you know will be process ending. What action would you want to see? the Israeli government do? Simply capitulate and agree, we will end the war, withdraw all of our forces from Gaza, return to the status quo ante, if that's what it takes to get the hostages back? I don't think there's a simple answer to your question. I know that what I've been doing and many, many others is mobilizing the world community to pressure Hamas to get them to yes. I mean, we, there's also another party here, obviously. No, that's critical. Um, the world needs to tell okay. Hamas to let them go. Yes. So this, it's a complicated answer to what seems to be a very straightforward question. So we have to work that. In Israel, I mean, yes, it has its, the military capacity to pressure Hamas, but that alone isn't getting them out. So we have the world mobilized, and some very important things have happened in the last couple of weeks that have been ignored by the Israeli government and the Israeli media about internationalizing this crisis to mobilize not just the United States, but the other 20-something countries to work in concert against Hamas, to pressure them mostly financially, uh, things that simply have not been done yet. So this is part of our work as, as hostage families to mobilize that. As far as Israel is concerned, there's absolutely no expectation, and it would be madness, for a unilateral ceasefire, for Israel to simply stop fighting and hope that um, that Hamas will release some 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 hostages, that of course is 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 silly. There has to be a negotiation. A negotiation has to be ongoing, along with these other forms of pressure, and and our prime minister must prioritize the lives of these hostages over his continued. Um, role as prime minister if, in fact, his radical messianic coalition partners threaten him with breaking up the coalition. There are other factors, perhaps, in his mind as well that are keeping him from being a truly sort of um, um, engaged or truly engaged in this negotiation process. In your assessment, as a citizen, as someone who's been fighting to release the hostages, do you think that Hamas is interested in releasing the hostages in exchange for an end to the war? Or have they lured us into a trap that Hamas actually 
wants to drag this war out for as long as possible because they don't care how many people get killed on the mm. other side. And so even if Israel says, you know what, we're going to pull our forces out tomorrow, just give us back the hostages, Hamas won't do it. Uh, and the negotiations are a way for them to try to string Israel along. And it's in bad faith from beginning to end. I have no doubt in the bad faith of Hamas. Uh, that's a given. That's a given. Um, I wonder, I'll get back to your question in a moment. I wonder, given what they've been doing, how much the government of Israel perhaps wants to drag out the war as well and not end it on whatever terms. Um, well, for, the government, for its own part, has been clear that it wants this war to end with the total destruction of Hamas and the release of the hostages. They yeah, don't but, want this to end tomorrow because it can't. Sure. Uh, but have been waiting around for months while our people are rotting uh, underground to take any kind of decisive action. Um, waiting these are around just facts. Un under a these great deal of international pressure absolutely. not to enter Rafa. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. But you want to be prime minister? Make tough decisions. Tough decisions, you know, the state of Israel was created in 1948. Mostly, and I'm, you're speaking with a, a, a child of, of Holocaust survivors, it was created not just for the right of Jews to kill Israel's enemies, but to protect Jewish life. The life of all citizens in Israel, keeping in mind that there are also non-Jews amongst the hostages. That is the first order of business. This government, not somebody else, this government and this army, unfortunately, uh, failed miserably on October 7th in the first thing that must be done. These weren't soldiers. These weren't combatants. There were a very small number of the hostages. These were civilians ripped from their homes. When anyone in our government goes to bed at night and gets up in the morning, if they sleep at all, this should be the first thing that they think about and dedicating all of their efforts and not as some secondary thought. Um, because terrorism, I'm afraid to say, is going to continue to haunt Israel. It always has. Bibi Netanyahu has been promising since I can remember him to destroy Hamas. He's been prime minister for a really long time. Um, it's simply inconceivable to me that all of a sudden, yeah, it, it, now it really has to happen. You've been prime minister for a long time. You cannot destroy an idea. That's the fallacy. There is going to be Islamic extremism no matter what we do. No matter what we do. We don't need every last Hamasnik to be killed. What we need is for Hamas not to be the governing and the military authority in Gaza. There's, a, there's some daylight between that and killing every last Hamasnik. In the end, I don't know. There's a lot of speculation. I, I don't claim to be an expert. I don't know if Yechia Sinwar wants to die, to be, to be martyred, if that's his goal. I suspect not because he would have done that already. There were plenty of you know, suicide bombers around to, that, that he could join. At the end of the day, Hamas will want to survive. It, it would be an ideal situation for every Hamasnik to be killed by an IDF bomb, an IDF soldier, whatever. Um, but that is not necessary for victory. I don't know. I don't know if an Israeli, a true Israeli victory can be gained after October 7th, no matter what the military outcome of the war. I don't know. Um, I know for sure that we can't even start to talk about victory if the hostages don't come home. And what you're talking about here really shines a spotlight on the Impossible moral and strategic dilemmas that Israel faces. On the one hand, we have to bring back the hostages, including your son. On the other hand, you're saying the price of doing that is to leave their captors free. We have to eliminate this sheer pure Not evil. Not leave them in Gaza. They can't be in Gaza. There's daylight. I don't want to get, again, into too many details. What we need is the result. The result is there's no more Hamas governing authority or military authority in Gaza. That is the strategic result that we need. It's no accident that this government, nearly eight months now, has not come up with a plan other than some mumbling about the day after. Mm. What does it look like? It's part of the reason there's so much international pressure and displeasure with Israel is because there aren't any clear war aims. It's just about killing more people, some of them guilty of horrible crimes, some of them civilians. Um, the war aim should be getting Hamas, eradicating Hamas 
in, in Gaza. That result does not demand necessarily burying every Hamasnik that is currently in Gaza. But that result may be in tension with the goal of getting all the hostages back, because Hamas is trying to use the hostages as a bargaining card to force an end to the war that, that will leave them in government in Gaza. That's for negotiations, and that's for this pressure. We've, we've become, most of us, captives of that narrative. Mm. And I simply do, it, it's total lack of crea creativity and imagination. That's what got us into this mess on October 7th, is the total lack of imagination uh, from our governmental leaders and also from the army. I want to go back to what you were saying about pressure, because your son, Sagi, one of the eight American hostages in Gaza, three of those confirmed dead. You've been part of the American delegation. You've met President Biden himself, and you came away from that meeting saying you felt very encouraged, believing that the administration is completely committed, doing everything it can do to bring back the hostages. And I'm wondering whether since that meeting in December, I think it was, so. when there has been a rupture in U.S. Israel relations with President Biden suspending arms sales, uh, an arms shipment in order to stop an offensive in Rafah, a move that many criticized as weakening Israel, strengthening Hamas, making a hostage deal less likely by making the terrorists doubt the united resolve of our allies. Whether you still believe that the United States is completely committed and doing everything it can to bring the hostages home, or whether you think that its own objectives have changed to try to bring this war to a speedy resolution because it's causing political problems, the allegation is being made at the expense of the hostages. Well, first I'd say that our, our interactions with the U.S. administration didn't end with that meeting. Mm. Uh, we have a bi-weekly meeting with Jake Sullivan, uh, mm -hmm. the national security advisor, uh, who is you know, obviously a very important figure around these issues. And I think that uh, alone shows the seriousness with which yeah. the administration I mean, there's, there's takes no, it to meet the families. There, there's no comparison uh, between the U.S. administration and our current government in Israel in terms of the openness, the receptivity, and the listening. And it's a back and forth. It's reciprocal. Things that we have asked for and suggested have actually been acted upon, which is inconceivable in, in the Israeli context, because who are we in the eyes of the government ministers? Um, I've not met any in, in, on their own initiative uh, in Israel. As far as the U.S. Uh, um, policies are concerned, um, I am no less convinced today than I was in December. I think we in Israel have to recognize we are, we hope still, a regional power um, in the Middle East with you know, significant power projection, but a regional power. The United States is a superpower. It's got a lot on its mind in the Middle East and, and, and elsewhere. And not everything that we want, no matter how much we scream and yell and complain, is going to, is going to work for the United States. That being said, President Joe Biden is, the, in my opinion, and I'm a historian, is the best friend Israel has ever had in the White House, barring none. I challenge anyone to find me uh, or to show me that there's been a president in, in, that has been more helpful to Israel in a time of need. Sure, some 2,000 bomb, 2,000 uh, pound bombs were withheld. What was given at that time? Exactly at the same time. Um, we can find, because it's wonderful to claim that we're not doing what we could do because enemy, you know, all we're, we're being pressured from the outside. Um, the United States is not, has not held Israel back from going into Rafah. It says that we cannot bomb um, um, or attack um, heavily populated civilian areas. That's not an election stunt on Biden's part. That is a statement of policy and a statement of belief. Of course, there will be the Israelis who will say, well, what happened in Vietnam and what happened in Dresden? And okay, fine. Uh, but the world moves forward. And, and we have to understand that the world does move forward. And dropping 2,000-pound bombs, evidently, uh, in the middle of an extremely densely populated area with refugees who have nowhere to hide is not something that's palatable. Um, in the end, I think, I think, 
that only helps to the degree that it can Israel's image in the world that we've refrained from doing that now in in the incursion into Rafiah. Has the United States done everything that it can to pressure Hamas and its backers to let the hostages go? It will only be enough. This is true of everyone. This is true of Israel, this is true of, uh, of, of the United States, of Qatar, uh, of Egypt, anyone else who's engaged. Enough will be when they're home. What else can the US do? And I'm, and I'm asking this because there will be supporters of Israel, including in the US, who are listening to this podcast and want to know, what pressure do we put on the administration to pressure Hamas and its allies? What policy steps do we need to see against Qatar, against Turkey, against Iran? Again, what leverage does the US have that it is not using that we want our supporters to demand be activated now? Yeah, I think uh, in some cases they would be barging into an open door because we, we've, we've been working on this um, in the last few weeks, um, is this idea of a coalition of states. Um, you know, to some degree, the Europeans and others have been working on the sanction front and restricting Hamas's uh, uh, capacity to um, get money through conventional means or through cryptocurrencies. And um, the United States has been doing a lot um, in terms of legislation and, and so on and investigation. The pr what, what, what remains to be done is for all Western states, certainly those that have hostages, to really crack down in unison with the United States on all of the funding sources of Hamas. Hamas stays alive because it gets oxygen. Its oxygen, for the most part, is money. Um, and you need to choke that off. And we must choke that off. And that, for better, Israel has very little that it can do. Uh, around that other than perhaps, you know, uh, raise the flag ar around that and perhaps point out in, in, in intelligence services, you know, uh, bottlenecks or, or, or points that could be pressured. But the United States, not in and of itself, but can, can perhaps work faster in getting that coalition together. You're a historian, as you've said. Be familiar that in the ancient world, being able to say, I am a Roman citizen, Kivis Romanus Sum gave you immunity because they knew that you had the biggest superpower in the world behind you. And I'm wondering how it feels now, having known that your state failed to protect you and your family on October 7th, has not brought the hostages back, that you're having to play the I'm an American card, that it's not enough to say my son is Israeli and therefore he should be released, that you need to build a coalition and say these are American citizens for God's sakes, as if that is supposed to give them extra power or extra protection. Uh, we, I don't approach it that way, actually. Um, all 125 of the remaining hostages are equal in my eyes. I mean, Sagi is always going to be more dear because he's my son. Um, but I, I can tell you for sure that the Biden administration, or, or I'm using my Americanness, and it's very strange to do that as a lifetime kibbutznik, you know, who, who's lived his entire life on a very Israeli kibbutz. Uh, to pull the American card, I'm doing that n not because, you know, sort of get extra rights and privileges. It's all about access. As American citizens, we, myself and, and the other American citizens, have been privileged to be able to sit with the entire senior staff of the Biden administration and, you know, Congress people from wall to wall and to try to use that to mobilize for action, not to get special benefits for our loved ones. It's mostly uh, sons and, and one father, grandfather. Um, and in that sense, the Biden administration is completely with us. Mm. They are not working to get the eight Americans out. They're working to get all, all people out, regardless of their gender, their nationality, their age. And it's incredibly honorable uh, what they're doing. They didn't have to. And quite honestly, Biden is catching flack now from all sides because, of course, there are the more progressives in, in, in the United States that are hammering him uh, for uh, the administration's support for Israel. But increasingly, unfortunately, uh, from the right, both within the Jewish community and, of course, outside of the Jewish community, sort of the MAGA community, are hammering him that he's not doing enough for Israel. So um, I, 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 I think 
for the Jewish community everywhere, or, you know, all of your viewers, that's not a tree you need to climb. Uh, you know, criticizing the Biden administration. I think they're doing what they what the most that they could do under the circumstances. The Marines are not going to get the hostages out. Um, they have been crucial in orchestrating the negotiation process when it's been successful um, and, and you know, keeping Israel strong despite enormous press, pressure at home and abroad um, to, to, not, to not act in that way. So let's embrace the administration as an ally, regardless of what your political orientation is in domestic politics in the United States. And, and move forward with them and encourage them, yes, to do more. But I have, I have not found flaw in, in, in what they've done until now. And I'm a pretty observant guy. I want to go full circle. We started this conversation by saying you've been displaced from the Oz over a quarter of the residents, murdered, abducted on October 7th. The kibbutz essentially burned to the ground. You've been displaced, a refugee in your own country, as you put it. What future do you see for... Neil Oz, do you want to go back or do you see yourself once this is over and all the hostages are back, please God, rebuilding your life elsewhere? Well, what you're striking upon is um, what will be, it hasn't really emerged yet, a national crisis um, because um, all of the communities along the border had been evacuated. Uh, various levels of destruction in each one of them. Uh, from my understanding of things, uh, the vast majority, including in, in near Oz, the vast majority of those people who lived in those communities on October 6th are ambivalent at best, at best, about going back to live permanently in their, in their communities. Because how do you take children back to a scene where they experience well, such horrific trauma? Well, not just that. I mean, I wasn't there that day. And I go back and literally on every corner, on every pathway, it's a site of mourning for me where I know my friend was executed there. My neighbor was burned alive there. Um, my co-worker was abducted here. She was hit with a sledgehammer in her head over there. It's a place of nightmares. Um, and of course, any young family, logically, including my own kids, are not going to want to bring up their kids there when we simply, because of the crisis of faith um, or the breaking of that unwritten contract on October 7th, there's no way to convince them that this couldn't happen again. There's no way, with or without the destruction of Hamas. That, that's the fantasy. Um, so in all likelihood, um, well, I'll give you Nir Ozen as an example. There's a handful of older members of the kibbutz who may one day go back to the kibbutz when it's reconstructed. It literally has to be reconstructed. That's going to take years. Most likely, yeah. Um, all of the rest, most of the rest, have already decided that they want to remain. We want to remain as a community, multi-generational community, but not on Nir Oz. We are in the process of seeking out a place that we can settle. Kiryat Gat is a very, uh, our, our temporary uh, housing is temporary. No one wants to live there, nor can we. They, we don't, they don't belong to us, these homes. Um, and so we're in the process of seeking out a place not adjacent to, a, to the border where we can begin our lives again. But in truth, we can't begin our lives again until the hostages, our hostages, come home. We bury our dead, and we begin somehow to mourn those who we've already buried. No one's been mourning because we're in yeah. this state of limbo. Our cemetery is full of new graves, but yet we can't really mourn because we have these people that we're waiting for. And everyone is touched by this. Um, so the decisions themselves and the process of rebuilding souls can begin only when the hostages come home. Let's talk about how we get them home. Our listeners now want to join and mobilize and do more in the fight to bring the hostages home. 
What do you want our supporters around the world to do? It's not enough to wear a hostage pin or a dog tag. What should they do to help us in this fight? Well, you know, uh, right. Wearing a hostage pin or a dog tag is not going to get the hostages home. Um, actions help. Uh, actions in terms of organizing, um, pressuring your elected leaders to the degree that you can, especially in those countries where there are hostages. I mean, it, it is amazing to me that that is not frontline news in the United States or anywhere else. And as of the rally to release, the international rally to release the hostages a week before we filmed this, there were the nationals of 24 states. That's correct. Still trapped in Gaza. So being more active, particularly there, and these are almost all very important countries, all of whom can actively help in pressuring Hamas. Whatever they think about both the, 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 the people wanting to help and the governments, whatever they think about the conduct, Israel's conduct of the war, they can put pressure on Hamas that we all are agreed is evil. So people living in Britain or France or Mexico, for that matter, they can do that. The other thing that I would ask them to do, and this is perhaps a little out of everyone's comfort zone, um, is to do more to retake the public square uh, when it concerns Israel. Um, clearly, the people with the biggest megaphone in the West right now, in the public square, are anti-Israel, pro-Palestinian, um, we can argue about anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism. Pro Hamas. Uh, for the most part, pro Hamas. Um, it is a huge challenge to go up against that, not by screaming, not by yelling, certainly not by fighting physically, but to work as citizens of your own country to retake, to, to, to retake the public square, first and foremost, for the sanity of your own countries. That's a, that's a lot to ask on my part, but that's the fight that we all must fight because Hamas wins if the hostages die in captivity. No matter what happens on the battlefront, if they die in captivity, all of them, Hamas wins. Hamas also wins if the upshot of October 7th and the war that has followed is that these voices in the West they're the sole occupiers of the megaphone in the public square. It takes organization and it will take some courage. Uh, I understand that. Moral courage, mostly. Um, to get up and speak truth in your own countries uh, about what is happening here, particularly around the hostage issue. Professor Jonathan Dekelchen, I want to thank you for a very courageous, bold, frank, open conversation here on State of the Nation. I'm sure that for our viewers and listeners, it will have reinvigorated them to recommit to the fight to get all the hostages back home. Thank you. Thank you for fighting. Uh, thank you for continuing to be a voice for the hostages. And let's hope that we get all of them back home safe immediately. Thank you very much. Amen. Thank, thank you. you. And that brings us to the end of today's episode of State of a Nation with Professor Jonathan dekel Khen, whose son, Sagi, is still a hostage of Hamas for nearly eight months after the October 7 massacre. As always, please subscribe to State of a Nation on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever else you get your podcasts. And please keep fighting for the hostages' freedom. Retake the public space. Do not allow yourselves to be shouted down by the pro-Hamas mob. We need to get the hostages home. We need to get them back now. Thank you very much.